Good day, my name is Griselda van Bijk, and today we will be looking at the human nervous system. Right, have you ever thought about your nervous system? Did you think about what it looks like? Is it wires? Is it fibers? What does it look like? Now, um, I've got an answer for you now. If you can look at this picture here, it's a photo of a real human being. And um, you can see here, there is the brain. There's a spinal cord. And look at all these nerve fibers here into the arms and into the legs. Right. So that is actually what your nervous system looks like. Now, you might wonder, where did I get this photo from? Well, this was a real person who donated his body to this um, organization that we call Body Worlds. Body Worlds is an international organization which do exhibits across the whole world. They were here in 2010 in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. And I was one of the lucky ones that can go and have a look at it. And it was really great. All these dead people without skin. You could see the muscles. You can see what an eyeball looks like. You could see the ear bones, the bones in the ear. You could see blood vessels. Um, they actually saw some people in half. You could see people from the side. And this was real human beings who obviously donated their bodies after they died. So they, they actually inject them with some kind of plasticine so that they don't rot and stink up the place. So, um, yeah, it was very interesting. And um, I couldn't eat that evening, you know, it's like meat was like gross for me. But I would really recommend to you as a life sciences student to go to their website, Body Worlds, and go and have a look at those pictures of those real bodies. And then you will find things like this. So this was an actual human being, the actual brain, the actual brain. These spinal nerves here, are not spinal, cranial nerves here, spinal nerves here from the spinal cord, it's actual nerves. So it's really, I would really recommend you to go to this website. But let's move on. Right, so we've been doing um, the previous lesson, reasons for nervous system. We have done the central nervous system, right? Today, we're going to look at the peripheral nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. After that, we will continue with nerve cells, then the reflex arc, and then illnesses of the human um, nervous system. So it's going to be a very busy day today. Right, but before we go there, we need to do some keywords. Firstly, we have the central nervous system, central nervous system. Remember, I said in the center, Mr. Fenter, that is the central part. Let's go back to that little body. The central part, this part, yeah, that is your central nervous system, right? The brain and the spinal cord, right? Next is the cranium. Now, um, oh, peripheral, sorry, peripheral nervous system. That is the nerves on the outside of the nervous system. So this is your central nervous system. The periphery is on the sides, where you look the sides. So the peripheral nervous system. It's down to your limbs and to the sides. Peripheral, away from the central nervous system. Right? So it's outside the central nervous system. Then we have the cranium. Remember the last time we did uh, the brain, I told you that you've got a skull, and inside the skull there is a hole or a bony casing where your brain is situated. So that is the cranium, and you need to know that. So the cranium is the place in the skull where the brain is situated. Right, we've already said that. Now we get a nice term here, dorsal. And I think you've heard this term before and you, was, you were wondering, what is dorsal? Now, dorsal is always the back part. The back part, your back. Or if an animal is standing like this, remember his back is on top. So the top part or the back part, that's dorsal. Right? So it's the back part or top part. Next is um, ventral, which I do not see on this slide. Um, ventral is the stomach side, your stomach, or if it's an animal, it will be the bottom side of, of the animal, right? So when they talk about ventral, remember your stomach and dorsal, your back, right? 
afferent is when they conduct inwards. So that would be your peripheral system conducting impulses towards the central nervous system, inwards, right? Efferent will be your central nervous conducting outwards towards the limbs and the organs and the muscles. Right, so the peripheral nervous system, like I said, the periphery, that is um, consisting of 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Now, if you look at this picture, here's our central nervous system. Remember, center, Mr. Fenter. This spidery thing's coming out here, these little lines here, that is your peripheral, your peripheral nervous system. Now, the cranial nerves will be here from the brain, the cranium, and the spinal nerves will come from the spine. The spine. So it's, it's really not brain surgery to know this. It's very easy. Brain is cranial. Spine is spinal nerves. Right. So what does the peripheral system do? Firstly, it connects the central nervous system to the organs, limbs, and skin, which is kind of important because... The central nervous system makes all the decisions. Your brain makes, interprets everything and makes the decisions on how it's going to react to it. Then it carries sensory and motor information to and from the central nervous system. So if you, something bites you, the senses will, will send the impulse towards the central nervous. The brain will interpret and send via the motor system back to your muscles to react. Right, so that's what the peripheral service do. Thirdly, you have the, uh, it regulates the involuntary body functions like heartbeat and breathing. Your people, I know a lot of lazy people out there. Imagine if you had to now control your own breathing and your heartbeat. I'm telling you, there would have been a lot of dead people. Lots. You would not last a minute. So be thankful for your nervous system. And then fourthly, it allows the brain and spinal cord to receive and send information to other areas of the body. So, you see a cake, your eyes see the cake, sends the impulse to the brain, the brain tells your legs, walk towards the cake, you're walking towards the cake, your arms are getting the plate, the knife, you're cutting, the brain is telling the mouth to salivate, right, because you're going to eat this cake now, and now you're eating. And that's all you, but your brain is coordinating this whole system. And that is basically what the peripheral nervous system does for you. So be thankful that you have one. Um, we're going to take a short break now, an ad break, and I will hope to see you after the ad break. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice break and you're all refreshed and you're ready to start with the peripheral nervous system. Right, so let's see what we're going to do now. We've done the introduction to the peripheral nervous system and we will now also talk about the autonomic nervous system. Let's move on. Right, the peripheral nervous system can be divided into two parts, namely the somatic or the voluntary part, right? The voluntary part is like what I explained about the cake situation. You see the cake, your brain decides, I want that cake, right. So, but you made the decision. You are actually in control of the situation. And you go, you go and eat the cake. Or you see a ball, you want to kick the ball. You kick the ball. You know, you slap somebody. You eat, you read, you sleep. That is voluntary control, right. So you have control over that. And that's the somatic part of your peripheral nervous system. Right, so that's this part. Now, the autonomic... Auto means automatic, right? You don't have any control over this. Autonomic is involuntary, right? You have no control. You cannot manage it. It's just happening in your body and be thankful it's happening or else you would be dead, right? So like I said, the somatic nervous system controls your skeletal muscles, but it's voluntary. You, you are part of this decision making, right? Then... Um, the autonomic nervous system, this one here, controls the involuntary muscles. Now, you, you have muscles in your organs, your internal organs like your kidneys, your livers, and, uh, and your stomach. So that is being controlled by the peripheral nervous system. It also affects your heart rate, your breathing, 
like I said, imagine you had to control this. You would be dead within a minute. Digestion, gland function. It also allows the body to react to changes so that homeostasis is a term that mean, um, actually means the balance in your body is maintained. Now, this term you will be do, doing in much more detail when we do the endocrine system. Right. So, now we finish with the peripheral nervous system. We're going down one branch. We're going to the autonomic nervous system being branched into two branches. Right. The first one is the sympathetic and the second one is the parasympathetic. I just want to go back here and show you. So, we've done the, um, the auto... No, not this one, sorry. This one. Why can't I get the one? There it is. Okay, so we've done the peripheral, and remember we said it's one, two. Now we're going down. We're moving down. We are seeing what, what's happening in the autonomic nervous system. Don't confuse the two. Learners sometimes confuse the two. They confuse the peripheral and the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system is part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so let's just move back to those slides. So if you look at the autonomic nervous system, we've got the first branch, which is the sympathetic branch. Look at this little man here. He's got big eyes, he's running away, he looks kind of scared, he's just wanting to get out of there. So there's like a lot of stress there. Parasympathetic, para means next to, right, next to the sympathetic nervous system. This guy is chilling. Can you see how he's chilling? He's lying there on his little hammock, drinking a juice, sleeping a bit, maybe drooling some. You know, just chilling, relaxing, enjoying the life. So there's your two branches. Now let's see how it works. Firstly, the sympathetic nervous branch prepares for the energy expanding, stressful emergency situation. That little man had to run. The parasympathetic branch is active under ordinary restful conditions. That's your ordinary, your ordinary life when you, you know, you're just chilling, you're relaxed, you're just doing your everyday thing. And maybe it will be easier to remember that this one will be when you're writing exams. This guy's going to work quite a lot. And then this one will be when you're on holiday. Right. But let's look a bit further. The two systems have an opposite effect, and this is very important. We're going to go in detail there. One stimulates while the other inhibits. Right. Each organ in the body is innervated. Now, innervated is just a very fancy word for supplied. It's supplied. Right, it's supplied. Ooh, I don't write nicely, eh? Sorry about that. Right, supplied by a sympathetic and a parasympathetic nerve. So if you have a stomach, okay, you obviously have a stomach. Your stomach has a sympathetic nerve branch and a parasympathetic nerve branch coming onto this organ and controlling it. The one will inhibit its function and the other one will stimulate its function. Right. And we call this double innervation. This is very important. Double means because there's two. One, two. Innervation supply. Double supply. Double in innervation. But let's look in more detail at double innervation. Right, this is a nice diagram to, to help you to remember it. And I always like to start with the sympathetic nerves, this one, number one. Right, so let's give you some background. You are walking in the field somewhere, not where houses are, obviously, and all of a sudden you see a lion in the bush. Now, this lion looks hungry. He's not sleeping. He's actually salivating. Now, he saw you now. You know, he's thinking, take away. It's going to be nice this time. So what happens? Your body immediately goes in a flight and fright reaction. And you're stressed now, man, because you don't want to be eaten, obviously. Right. So what's the first thing that happens? Your pupils, those big black holes in your eye, becomes very big. It dilates. The pupil dilates. It becomes wider and bigger. Why do you think that would be? It's because now you need all the information you can get. So you need all the lights and all the images you can see. Because you now have to see what's the escape route from this lion. Right. So that's why your people will dilate when you're in shock. Because you need all the information to see how am I going to get out of this situation. Secondly, inhibits salivation. What is salivation? Salivation is um, when your glands start giving spit. You know, spit. When you eat, right? You, that is necessary 
to digest your food. You can't eat a pizza with a dry mouth. It's going to get stuck here in your throat, isn't it? You need that spit, that saliva, to make a nice round bolus so it can go down the, the magic gullet there. Right, go down and go, get digested. So now, if you see a lion there, are you going to feel hungry at all? I don't think so. He's, he is now salivating because he's seeing food. Right, but not you. And it's not like you're going to eat a burger while you're looking at him thinking now. Not at all, no. So that will stop immediately. And that's why when people are in car accidents or in a shocking, you know, a shockful situation, they will always tell you that their mouths are very dry. Right, then the third thing is increased heartbeat. Why do you think we need an increased heartbeat? While well, you see a lion, right, you need to turn into a heck of a sprinter. You need to be able to run the 100 meter faster than Usain Bolt, right? So now your heart is beating like crazy. It's beating, beating. It's pumping blood to your muscles, right? Your muscles need the oxygen and the nutrients to be a fast sprinter running, right? Your arms, everything now needs to be an athlete. Also, your brain needs all this oxygen because your brain is now doing physics, right? It's now calculating if the line is 5 meters there, the tree is 15 meters there. If I ran at 5 meters per second, will I be able to get to the tree or should I just run to this boulder? Yeah, you know, physics, you're thinking now, fast, because you need to get an escape route yeah, out of this situation. Also, your airways will relax. Now, airways relax means those bronchioles, and that is a throwback to grade 11, isn't it? Bronchioles, those lung pipes that you have, when they start relaxing, they don't go smaller, they go bigger, right? And when they go bigger, there's more air going in. If there's more air going in, there's more oxygen. You need oxygen now, right? Lots of oxygen in the brain and the muscles. So that is why your bronchioles will start relaxing so that you can get more oxygen. Right, inhibit activity of the stomach. Like I said, you don't feel like a burger when the lion is chasing you, right? So your stomach, when it's churning and churning and digesting food, it's taking up energy. You cannot spare energy now. You need all your energy to run away. So your stomach will stop. No digestion is taking place, right? Inhibit the gallbladder. Gallbladder is also part of digestion. It is um, giving bile, which is now digesting fats. You don't need to digest fats now. You need to run, so it will stop. But the liver will release glucose. Glucose is blood sugar, right? And you need that sugar for energy. So that's what the liver will be doing for you now. It will also inhibit the activities of the intestines. Right, now think of your intestines. Let's throw back to grade 11 again. Um, peristalsis is the term for your muscles in your intestines to um, contract and relax, contract and relax, contract and relax. So when food is going down, this muscle will contract and push the food down. This one will relax and then this one will contract again, pushing the food down again. Do you need this process when you run away from a lion? No, you don't. No, you don't at all because that takes energy. You don't need to spend your energy on anything else. Right. Relaxed bladder. No, it doesn't mean you're going to wet yourself now. No, that's not what relaxed bladder means. Relaxed bladder means the urine is now staying in the bladder. Because you do not have time to do a pit stop now around the bush. Sorry, I just need to do a, a quick you know, urination here around the bush. No, there's no time for that. So the bladder stays relaxed so that you don't urinate. Maybe it can be a strategy to urinate on the lion, but I don't think he'll mind, you know, a urinated human being. I don't know. Also, same thing here. Contract the rectum. You don't have to do number two now while you're running away from the lion. Right, so your rectum is contracting, keeping everything inside. You don't have time to sit down and do things because you have to get away. So this is basically the symp sympathetic nervous system. It basically it will protect you and get you away from a stressful situation. You will always have this reaction when you're under a lot of stress. So that is why, and I'm going to give you a secret about getting older. When you get older, you're a lot of stress in your house. You know, you've got children and finances and stuff. Then you have a lot of stress. And a lot of older people complain about stomach problems and intestine problems. The reason being this. Right, there it is. It's because of the sympathetic nervous system having to work all the time because you're under stress the whole time. 
Right, but let's have a look at the parasympathetic nervous system. Right, the parasympathetic nervous system, like I said, is next to the sympathetic uh, nervous system. That's what's para. Right, now that will be the opposite effect. Picture this. A teenager on a couch, on a bed with a cell phone, busy with Instagram or what TikTok, what are you guys doing now? Right, so you are relaxed. Your eyes don't need all the information. So your pupil constricts, right? It's not as dilated as when you're running from the lion. Okay, so you're like chilled now, man. And while you, your pupil is constricting now, the saliva is being stimulated. Like I said, that little guy lying in the, in the hammock, drooling. You are eating on your couch or while you're busy with your phone, eating chips, bread, whatever you have there. So like I said, when you eat a pizza, you need saliva or else that thing will get stuck in your throat, right? So you're, you're, you are relaxed and you are salivating. Next thing, slow heartbeat. You don't need a, a fast heartbeat when you're lying on the couch. You, you're quite relaxed now. You don't need all that oxygen. Your airways will be constricted. So those bronchioles will now just go back to normal size. They will constrict. That doesn't mean you won't get any air. It just means Less air will go in. You don't need so much oxygen when you're lying down there doing basically nothing, relaxing. Stimulate activity of the stomach. Right, now your stomach will start digesting food because you've been eating all day or you've just eaten 10 minutes ago, so it needs to do its work. And you've got all that spare energy so the stomach can start digesting, right? Gallbladder, the same thing. You are digesting, so you can now... Um, secrete bile and stuff like that. Stimulate activity of the intestines. Peristalsis can happen now. Your bladder can now contract, get all that urine out. When, obviously, when you go up and do it, you don't have to just lie there and do it. And also relaxing the rectum. So you can, you'll be able to go to the toilet now. All right, because you don't need to run away from a lion. So my advice to you is the following. These are two systems. Know only the one. And I actually always prefer the sympathetic one. You think of the lion. What don't you need when you have a lion running after you? Digestion. So all the digestive things will be inhibited. What do you need? Oxygen. So heartbeat will be fast. Air or oxygen. That will be your lungs. The bronchioles will um, relax. You'll, you have to go and have a look. Where can I escape? Big eyes, right? So if you can remember that, the parasympathetic is just the opposite. Right, so you don't have to go and study all of this. If you understand running away from the lion, you will be able to do it. Okay, but let's move on and look at some questions. Name two parts, two parts, of the peripheral nervous system. Right, remember I said don't get confused between the autonomic and the peripheral. So the peripheral is the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. Name, two, uh, name the branch of the autonomic nervous system that restores an increased heart rate back to normal. Right, oh, unfortunately, the, the answer is already there, but just think the heart rate was now, your heart was beating like this, you had stress. Which one now has to go bring it back down? The one that makes you chill, the parasympathetic. All right. Right, dilates the pupil of your eye. Remember, dilates means going bigger. When do you need a big pupil? When you see the lion. So that would be sympathetic. Right. Then, next, describe the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. Right, so you have to tell them what it is composed of and what it does. That's basically what they want there. So let's have a look. It is made up of the parasympathetic. You see, already got a mark there and sympathetic. Already two out of four, just by saying that. Every organ and gland is controlled by both parts. That fancy word, double innovation, you get a mark there. It controls involuntary events. Remember, you don't have any control over this. And then, I mean, there's already four marks, but if you, if you said sympathetic nerves generally increase response and parasympathetic nerves um, generally decreases response. You will also get marks. So there's six marks, but you only get four.
welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your little break and you are ready to go. So what are we going to be doing now? We have done the peripheral and the autonomic nervous system. Now we are moving to the nerve cells. Right, nerves. That is a new definition that's been added. And um, what is a nerve? It sends and carries signals to and from all parts of the body and are made up of neurons. So these signals it's sending is obviously our nerve impulses, right? So that's the signals they are talking about. Let's have a look at what a nerve fiber looks like. This is a spinal nerve. How do I know that? This is a spinal cord. Can you see there's a little H there or the little butterfly, the gray? and the white, if you remember, from the central nervous system. So your spinal cord here um, has the spinal nerve coming out of it, the spinal nerve, right? So here's the spinal nerve going there to, towards the rest of the body. But now it's branching into little roots. We call these roots. That is roots, right? And we have the, at the back, this is the dorsal side, and this here is the ventral side. Remember, ventral is your stomach, and that is the back there. So. What happens is your, your uh, nerve will leave the spinal cord and then you will look here in front. What you'll see is it's like nerve bundles here, right? And within this nerve bundles, we'll find our little nerve cells, neurons, right? You don't have to know the structure of the nerve cell or the nerve fiber. Um, that's just for interest sake, just to give you some little uh, background of what we are talking about. So you don't have actual nerve cells connecting here. The nerve cells are within the spinal nerve, right? There's cells in there, but the nerve is actually a, comp a compilation of a lot, a lot of nerve cells or ner neurons. So what is a neuron? They are specialized cells which connect the brain and the spinal cord to the other parts of the body, right? So they are cells, they are microscopic little things. Now you've got the following parts. And these are the only parts that you need to know. The cell body, cytoplasm, nucleus, dendrite, axon, myelin sheath. These people, these are the only ones. I know in your textbook there are Schwann cells and node of Ranfeer and yours, they've got a lot of things there. Yes, they are scientifically correct, but we don't award marks at the end of the year if you wrote, write those um, labels. Keep to these that I'm telling you today. It's in the exam guidelines. That is what is required. But let's have a look. This is a typical neuron. You can see this part here. This is a cell body, right? So that little dark thing there will be the nucleus. You know that's where the DNA is. This will be the cytoplasm. And um, then you have these little protrusions out here, like that. We call them the dendrites, dendrites, right? They will always take the nerve impulse towards the cell body, right? Then we have a very long protrusion here, and that we call the axon. The axon will always take the nerve impulse away from the cell body, right? So the cell body is your central place here, the dendrites will take it towards it, and the axon will take the impulse away from it. That is where the myelin sheath come in. It's extremely important. This is the insulation, it's a fatty layer there, and if you think at home, say, for example, you make tea, you take your kettle and you want to plug it into the wall, into the wall socket. Do you have copper wires there that you now are putting into the wall? No. You will shock, you will have pain, you'll die maybe. No, you can't do that. The kettle's cord is insulated with plastic. You don't touch the copper wires. You, and the reason for that is being, firstly, safety. You don't shock, the, the, the electrical impulses don't get lost, and the kettle will, in any case, not boil then. So um, that is what the myelin sheet does. It, it insulates the axon and it ensures that this impulse will go there fast. It will move through there fast. So it increases the speed of your, your um, nerve impulse. Now there are three types of neurons. The first one is the sensory neuron or the afferent. Remember, afferent means towards the central nervous system, right? So it's towards the central nervous system. And that's this one. It looks like a little alien eye. I always think of a little monster or alien looking at me there, right? The cell body is here on the side looking at you, right? So that will be your receptor cell and the impulse will be moving that side. Then your interneurons, they are always found in the spinal cord. They look like a little tree. Can you see there? 
it's like a little bush there, right? And then the motor neuron are the efferent, what does efferent mean? Away from the central body, right? So it will take the impulses from the central nervous to the effectors, and that's what the motor neuron looks like. Let's look in, into more into them in more detail. This is a motor neuron. I took this from the DBE textbook, the new one. And it's also always multipolar. Multipolar means look at all those dendrites there. You can see it's lots of them, hey? So that is multipolar. You need to, if you have to draw a labeled drawing, you need to draw the cell body, the nucleus, the cytoplasm, the myelin sheath, the axon, right? And remember, it will always be away from the cell body, so the direction of the impulse will always go down. And these are the terminal ends of the axon. All right, next one. I call it the alien one. Little eye looking here at me. That's the cell body, right? Nucleus, cytoplasm, and the axon. And it will always go from the receptor to the central nervous system here at the bottom. Central nervous system. That's the direction of the impulse. Next one. The interneuron, also multipolar. Can you see all those dendrites there, right? So the dendrites, the cytoplasm, the nucleus, the cell body. Can you see it's very easy? And the axon and obviously the myelin sheath. Right, that you mustn't... Oh, I'm writing so ugly. Not good with that. All right. So um, that is basically the three neuron cells that you get. Right, now just an interesting fact is that blue whales, remember that's a very big fish in this ocean, huge. They have neurons that can be between uh, 10 and 30 meters in length. That is immensely long. And this is a microscopic cell, so the axon will be 10 to 30 meters in length. That is amazing if you think about it. A giraffe, those animals with the long necks, those necks five meters long. So the axons in those necks must be five meters long. Human neurons, it depends on how tall you are, but from your, basically from your hip here down to your leg can be a meter long. But I mean, if you're short, you're only a meter long, your axon won't be that long, right? Our nervous system allows for a one millisecond response time. People, that is extremely fast, right? So immediately you will have a reaction if there's pain or something threatening you. Right, let's look at some questions. Indicate the type of neuron in the diagram. Obviously, that will be a motor neuron. State one function of part B. Part B is the axon. I said axon always carries the impulse away from the cell body, right? And towards the effector, the muscle or the gland. It must react. Explain the roles of part C in the functioning of the neuron. That's part C there. That is obviously your myelin sheath. You have to explain. So you have to say what it's doing. It's insulating, right? It's insulating. And that's why the impulses will be conducted faster. And lastly, uh, the diagram shows different neurons. You'll see here, uh, there's the sensory, the sensory, the motor, and the motor neuron, right? Give only the numbers one, two, and three, or four of the two neurons that transport impulses from the receptor to the central nervous system. Remember, receptor to central nervous system. That will be number one and number four, the googly eye one, right? Then we'll have a faster transmission of, transmission of impulses. That will be the ones with the myelin sheath. Remember, I said myelin sheath insulates and increases the speed. So that will be one and three. So after all that information you got now, it's time for a break. Go and get some cool drinks, some cake, and then you come back after the ad break. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your break. Maybe add some cake, some cool drink, and you're ready to go. Let's have a look where we are now with the human nervous system. We have done the peripheral and the autonomic nervous system. Today we have done the nerve cells. Now we're going to do the reflex arc and illnesses. Let's continue. So before we get to reflex arc, you need to know an important concept, which is synapses. Right. That is the point where the impulse passes from the terminal branch of the axon to the neuron 
um, uh, from the one neuron to the dendrite of the next neuron. So if you have a look at this picture here, you will see that's the axon, right? And there's little vesicles. And in those vesicles, there are chemicals we call neurotransmitters, right? So what happens is those vesicles move to the end of the axon's terminal, right? And it bursts open, releasing these chemicals. And these chemicals move to the dendrite of the next neuron, right? It makes a little vesicle again, and it moves on, right? So that is how basically a nerve impulse will be transmitted from one neuron to the next over a synaptic gap. We call this a synaptic gap, right? It's a gap. And the neurons will never touch each other. They will never, ever touch each other. So why is this important? The synapse will in ensure that the impulse travels in one direction. So these chemicals won't go there and there and all over the show. It will go in one direction, right? One direction only. And the synapse of a nerve impulse can either be speeded up or slowed down to be or blocked. So that means basically when you drink alcohol, the alcohol will slow down these chemicals here. And the chemicals will start swimming here and swimming here and swimming there. That's why your reaction time when you're drinking is so much slower. That's why you shouldn't be driving when you're drinking. But other drugs will also have the same effect. I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you what drugs, but they have an effect on your neurotransmitters, which will make you slower or maybe faster. Right, now we're getting to the next part of the human nervous system, namely the reflex action. This is a very important part of the syllabus, or oh, they love to ask it. So you need to know this definition. Re reflex action is a quick, automatic response to a stimulus. This is when you put your finger against something that burns. You don't know it's hot, maybe. You're a bit slow, you're a bit stupid or something. Right, and before you even see that your finger is on this hot plate, your nervous system already reacted and pulled away your hand, right, to save your poor finger. That is a reflex action, very quick, very fast to save you. And it, the impulse never goes through the brain. It immediately goes through the spinal cord back to your finger. So you don't even realize this is going on while it's going on. So let's have a look at this situation here. You can see the flame of the candle there. That's a stimulus. That will now stimulate the receptors in your skin there. And that will send an impulse along your arm to the central nervous system. Can you see that this is the spinal cord? Right. Not the brain. It's not going to the brain. So immediately, interneuron is there. The impulse is moving there. And then through the motor neuron, the motor neuron ends up in the effector. Effector is the one that is now doing, um, affecting the change or uh, reacting to the situation. So this muscle will now contract and pull this hand away from the candle without you ever even knowing. After that, they will, the signal will also go to the brain, but your brain is a bit further up and you will feel ouch and you will feel stupid maybe. Right. So reflex action, like I said, is quick, automatic, you don't control this, respond to stimulus. And um, it allows for a quick response without thinking, because if you had to think about it, your finger would have been burnt to a pulp, right? And examples of this is a knee jerk. When you go to the doctor, they will usually have a little hammer and hit you on the leg. It's, no, he's not like, like in pain and stuff. You just want to see if your reflex actions are still okay. Sneezing when something flies into your nose, coughing when something goes down the wrong pipe and your body needs to protect you, or blinking, right, when something flies towards your eye and you need to blink quickly to get that mosquito out of there. Right, so this is all part of reflex actions. But now you must know the difference between a reflex action and a reflex arc. Arc is the pathway along an impulse is transmitted to bring about a quick response. So this is basically the road or the path that these impulses are taking, right? That, that's the difference. The action is the actual action, the quick automatic action. The arc is the pathway along which the impulse is transmitted to bring about a quick response. The nervous impulse goes to the spinal cord, like I said, then passes from the spinal cord directly. It doesn't go to the brain to the effector. The effector is the muscle or the gland that needs to now um, affect immediate 
response or else you'll burn your finger. Let's look at an actual diagram of a reflex arc. Firstly, we'll start with the sensory cells, right? This will be in your finger or in your skin, and this will now indicate, get the stimulus from the flame or whatever is now causing the problems, right? And they are called the receptors, right? Receptors. And they will convert the stimulus, and you need to use these words, stimulus, to an impulse, right? So that impulse is now moving along the sensory neuron, you can see here, into the spinal nerve. And remember I showed you a picture of the spinal nerve and it's having this little root. So the dorsal root will be the one at the back, right? So the sensory neuron is always in your dorsal root. And can you see there's a little bubble there? Remember we call this bubble the ganglion from the central nervous system. We, we did that in the central nervous system. This is where your cell body is found, the cell body of your sensory neuron. So when you see the little bubble, the little ganglion, you always know that this is the dorsal root and that's your sensory neuron. So the impulse is now carried all the way here and you will see that this part here is the gray matter, the butterfly or the H, right? And remember this, the other part is called the white matter, right? So what happens with the impulse? It is now moving across a synaptic gap. There is a synaptic gap between the sensory neuron and the interneuron, right? So the impulse will move across that synaptic gap to the interneuron. This is the interneuron there. And remember, interneuron, we always find on in the spinal cord, nowhere else. So this is your interneuron, the impulse will be moving right down towards the motor neuron. There will once again be a synaptic gap. Talk about the synaptic gap when you answer a question on this. So it will move across that synaptic gap to the motor neuron. Now the motor neuron will now transmit this impulse in the ventral root. Ventral is the front, right? Ventral root towards the muscle or the effector. Remember, the effector is the one that's affecting the change. Now, this muscle will now contract and it will move the finger away from that flame. Right, so that is a short, or not a short, but a, a diagram of showing how a reflex arc works. So, remember, the important parts is the receptors, the stimulus um, converted to an impulse. Impulse moving along the um, sensory neuron. You have to know the sensory neuron the dorsal root, then you have to go to the spinal cord, the interneuron, and remember your synaptic gaps here, right? So the impulse will move across those synaptic gaps again, interneuron to the motor neuron, through the ventral root here, to the effector. That's also a very important part if you answer this question in an exam paper. Let's move on. Let's look at some questions that they've asked in the past. Give only the letter of the part that, that represents the effector. Remember, effector is that the one that must pull away or affect the change. And if you look, look at that picture there, you will see that that's muscle. And the muscle is E. Right, interneuron. That can only be in the gray part, the gray part of your spinal cord. Right, and that will be A. Next question, sensory neuron, remember the bubbly, the bubble, you have to look at the bubble, dorsal root. So that will be number C, not B, because B is, look, is, is, is pointing at the bubble. C is actually the neuron there. So it would be C. Like I said, C. But let's move on. Give the letter and the name, two things. So you have to give two things here of the neuron in a diagram that is probably damaged, right? If a person is able to detect the stimulus but cannot respond. So now you have to think. If you can detect it, it means that the, the neuron from your senses, your sensory neuron is still working. But you, you're not reacting, you're not doing anything. That means that your motor neuron is not working. So if the motor neuron will not be working. You have to give both because they're asking for two. Right, state if the nerve impulse travels from D to E or from E to D. Now, if you look, there's D, right? So it's all the way around here to E or from the muscle to the flame. No, it's definitely from D to E. Right, so now we're going to move on to the next part of 
the nervous system and that is illnesses or disorders of the nervous system. But before we can do that, we must look at some keywords. The first one is autoimmune disease. That is a disease that's caused by your own immune system, right? Your, your immune system starts attacking healthy tissues, right? So that's the first one. Dementia is a decline in memory and reasoning. And progressive illness is an illness that gets worse and leads to death. So there's, it cannot be helped. This one, there's no cure for this one. You, you're basically going to get worse and worse and worse until you die. Right, now the first one we're looking at is the Alzheimer's disease. Right, this is the most common form of dementia. If you look at the infographic here on the side, you will see Alzheimer's is a specific brain disease that accounts to 60 to 80% of dementia cases. But if you look at dementia, it's a general term for symptoms um, like decline in memory, reasoning, and other thinking skills. So dementia is the overall condition, but Alzheimer's is one of one of the illnesses that causes dementia, right? And it usually affects people over 65, but unfortunately some people will get it early on, right? And this is a horrible illness because if you look at these pictures of the brain, this is a healthy brain. Can you see there? Lots of tissue there. But now look at the Alzheimer's brain. Look at those holes that is there. So the neurons and the synapses basically disappear. That's what a loss of neurons and synapses in your brain. So that's why they can't think, remember, and so on. There's absolutely no cure. It leads to death, and they don't know what it causes, what causes it. It's just something that happens. Right. And what is the symptoms of it? Slower thinking, behavioral changes. So I actually say people get more... Um, they get conflict and aggressive, confused, they don't know where they are, what's the time, the place. They don't recognize their own family, people that they used to know. They have difficulty in speaking, swallowing and walking. So this is really a terrible illness. The next one is multiple sclerosis, right, MS. This is also progressive, degenerative, means breaking down of the central nervous system. Diagnosis it's usually between the ages of 20 and 40 when they diagnose you with this illness and it affects more women than men. Right, so this is an autoimmune disease and it means many scars at MS. Can you see that the myelin sheet there is damaged, right? So that's causing scars and that is why um, it makes it impossible for the impulse to move along. It affects movement, feeling, balance, tingling and numbness, muscle weakness, fatigue, bladder and bowel problems, pain, concentration and memory loss, mood swings, and there's unfortunately no cure for this illness. So this brings me to the end of our section today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot, and I will hopefully see you next time when I do the eye.